Today, I'm going to talk a bit about DATEX L, um, the German CSPDN. CSPDN means Circuit Switched Public Data Network. It's a type of uh, public network uh, that was provided in addition to telephony networks um, some decades ago. Um, this is a talk is part of the Retro Net Call series, which is a series of talks uh, about retro networking to, uh, um, topics that we spun off the Osmo Dev Call, the Osmocom Developer Call, uh, which is about open source mobile communications uh, projects. Um, so, yeah, uh, a disclaimer before we go into the actual topic. Um, uh, I never used DATEXL when it existed, so this is all just based on reading historical books, articles, uh, specifications, whatnot. And of course, my understanding might be incorrect, so if anyone has uh, better knowledge or more expertise, or um, please uh, correct me, I'm very happy to learn more about um, old technology. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions um, that um, can be part of the record, feel free to raise them at any time. Um, uh, just write in the chat or raise your hand or something like that. Um, uh, apart from that, we can do it after. If you don't want it on the record, we do it after the recording has uh, finished. So, yeah, what is a CSPDN, a Circuit Switched Public Data Network? Um, so, basically, the name leads us to two different terms that have uh, a well-known understanding. The first is circuit switch. So it is about dedicated circuits which are established and released, uh, just like in the telephone network. Um, we, we make a call, um, and then the call is established, and we have an end-to-end -end, um, uh, dedicated uh, resource, um, the voice call in, in the, or the, the call in the telephony network or the data call in the CSPDN network. Um, and uh, it can be released by either sides at a later point. So this is quite different from packet switch networks, such as IP networks, um, or also the DATEXP, uh, DATEXP network in Germany, which is not what I'm talking uh, about today. So it's about circuit switch technology. And it's a public data network, meaning it is, well, it's a public network and it transports data. Um, so it's available to the general public like the uh, telephony network, but it's used for data, not speech, unlike uh, the telephony network. Um, and those uh, circuit switch packet data networks were separate networks independent of the telephony networks. So we're not talking about using some modems uh, on top of uh, telephony networks. Um, but we're talking about a complete and entirely separate network that existed in parallel to the telephone network and in parallel to possibly other networks. So for example, in the early days, it existed in parallel uh, to the Telex network, meaning um, uh, yeah, the teletype kind of devices. Um, and it also existed at the end uh, in parallel to, for example, the ISDN network, um, uh, which uh, was again an ind uh, independent network. So independent means we have uh, separate infrastructure, separate switches, um, uh, and um, the only part that may or may not be reused uh, for is, of course, uh, some of the cables that already existed um, uh, either in the backbone or in the subscriber line, but uh, separate switches. Uh, so uh, even if the same cable could be physically routed to a telephony switch or to a, a CSPDN switch, um, that was something you did once uh, and then it was used and, and permanently attached for years or decades to one type of network. Um, so it's not, uh, it's, there's, there's no connection between those networks. It's just that cables can be used either this way or the other way. So what did we have before those CSPDNs came around? And we will look a bit at the history and the timeline briefly. Um, oh, actually, I see some <laughs> embarrassing copy and paste mistake in that slide. <laughs> Sorry for that. So. Of course, there was the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, uh, that is not for 50 bits per second. It's an analog network. There's no bits per second. Uh, it's an analog network. It was initially manually switched and later electromechanically switched, meaning that uh, uh, connections are made at uh, central offices or exchanges. 
And in the uh, telephony network, it's an analog circuit. So uh, there's no digital uh, part of it in the classic PSTN, um, meaning that analog signals up to 3.4 kilohertz uh, could pass it. Um, and uh, yeah, end-to-end -end analog connection with possibly amplifiers and uh, modulators, demodulators, whatever in between, but um, it's an analog end-to-end -end circuit. Um, then we had the public switch Telex network, um, which uh, was for uh, Telex or Fernschreiben in German. Uh, those networks uh, were also analog, um, but uh, all the devices connected to it were digital devices, basically uh, yeah, Telex devices, so um, uh, teletypes which uh, used a fixed speed of 50 bit per second. Uh, it was asynchronous start-stop um, transmission. Um, so there's no central clock, or nothing. Uh, there's a start bit, uh, I think a five bit um, data uh, field and, and a stop bit. And that uh, is asynchronous transmission mode. And it also was an analog network end-to-end, -end, meaning that the switches really just created electrical connections and those bits were transmitted uh, from one end to the other over the analog circuit uh, in between. Um, that switching, like in the telephony network, was initially manually and then later moved over to electromechanical. For a long time, of course, it was mixed mode. So some exchanges were using electromechanical automatic switching and uh, some uh, connections or some exchanges to analog. I know in Germany, for example, I think the uh, international connections in Telex were manually switched for quite some time, even after the national Telex network was already um, fully uh, automatic switching. Um, what you could also have already before CSPDNs were around as direct point-to-point -point links. Um, that means it's a permanent uh, circuit, a permanent connection between two subscribers um, on, on the two sides of the link. There's no switching involved. Those are hardwired and set up once, and then they run for months, years, decades. Um, so no switching uh, and no dialing and no connections that are established or released. It's always on and it's, it's permanent. In German, uh, there are two terms that show up in the literature and in the documents, and also sometimes in this presentation. One of them is HFD or HFD, if you uh, pronounce the acronym in English. Uh, the German name is Hauptanschluss für Direktruf, um, which is basically um, not just the least copper line, um, but you also get the, uh, the modem or the data communications equipment from the operator. So the interface to the user is basically some kind of serial interface. There's different flavors of this. And um, the operator provides you the service of transporting these serial data bits that you uh, send over the serial interface um, uh, via some network somewhere and it appears at another end, but on both sides, the, the interface towards the network is a serial interface. Um, and um, it is basically not the concern of the subscriber whether or not modems are used or what kind of uh, transmission technology is used or what modulation forms or whatever. That's all an internal implementation detail of the network. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, I think uh, rather um, uh, predominant uh, before the CSPDN came around. The other option was called Überlassung Posteigener Stromwege. Uh, if you translate that to English, it's something like leasing of post uh, property uh, circuits. Uh, so in that case, uh, you really only rented the bare copper wires and you attached your own uh, communication equipment to that. Um, some terminology um, that will show up in uh, this talk, or at least in the first half or so of it. So we have DBP. If that DBP shows up, it's Deutsche Bundespost, which is the German uh, postal services uh, operator, government-owned monopoly until the 1990s. Um, CSPDNs, uh, I already mentioned it several times. Uh, it's the general abstract concept of such public circuit switch data networks, uh, which was defined in the CCITT, how it was called still back then, 
or now the ITUT, so an international organization of the various um, government uh, postal administrations. Um, and then the CSPDN technology was implemented in various different countries, um, or rather was implemented by vendors of equipment. Um, uh, and then this equipment implementing the CSPDN principle was used to create networks. And uh, one such network in Germany was the Datex L network. Um, Datex means data exchange. So even though it's a German uh, acronym from the 1960s, it already used English terminology. And the L is for Leitungs oriented, which means uh, circuit oriented. Um, and uh, this is uh, the topic of uh, this talk. There was also Datex P for packet oriented, uh, the packet switched public data network, uh, which is off topic here. I'm sure we will have a talk about this at some other incarnation of the retro network. Another topic that shows up in this talk is IDN, the Integrated Text and Data Nets, uh, Integrated Text and Data Network. Um, that was the German network uh, that was created um, initially in 90, it was inaugurated in 1975. And it was used to provide services such as Telex or Gentex, which was the internal network of the postal services to transmit uh, telegrams um, electronically between different post offices in Germany, and also the Datex services, so Datex services. So IDN basically is an underlying network technology that was used to provide Datex L service. Um, and the system, the hardware and software that was used to create this IDN network is called EDS. Uh, EDS is for Elektronisches Datenvermittlungssystem, Electronic Data Exchange System. Uh, and that is the switching technology uh, developed by Siemens and uh, um, Standard Electronic Lorenz, two German manufacturers. Um, they provided the actual hardware and, and software running on the hardware to create the IDN, which was used to provide the Datex L service. So um, just to get an overview, these are the kind of services that you could get in 1980. Um, as I said, well, we will look at Datex uh, again in, in the timeline in another slide, but uh, this was just a diagram that I could find from 1980 when all these different technologies coexisted. So um, we have uh, digital uh, data and text uh, network here, which uh, this is basically the IDN here, uh, this box. And you have uh, dialed connections and permanent connections. And the dialed connections uh, could offer Telex service or this uh, teletype service, the Datex network, uh, which we will be talking about today. Um, and uh, also the Gentex, the internal network uh, for transmission of uh, telegrams. Uh, and you could also get uh, leased lines. As I said, these, these are the two uh, things I already mentioned. So uh, we had here these HFD connections with the, the modem or data communications equipment provided. And then also the, uh, the option to get um, uh, leased lines uh, basically without any equipment. And then yeah, we have, of course, the telephony network and, and other, um, other transmission lines that uh, existed in, 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 the, um, in the service back then. So why would you create a completely separate data network independent of the telephone network that already existed or independent of the telex network that already existed? Um, the problem is, and we are going back to basically 1960s here, is that it was rather technologically difficult to transmit digital data over hundreds or even thousands of kilometers of analog telephone lines. Um, some modems were already developed in, that, in those days, but they were very slow. So we're talking about something like up to 300 bits per second. Um, and they're very expensive because this is and before uh, the um, uh, integrated circuits uh, and, and the like large scale integration uh, came around. So it was rather complex circuitry, rather expensive um, and uh, challenging uh, in, in those days uh, to, to communicate data over the telephone network. Um, 
so slow and expensive those modems for the normal analog telephony network um, and also you had a very long connection establishment time uh, keep in mind that at the day of electromechanical switches in germany we had pulse dialing only so uh, um, setting up a connection we are talking about uh, you know um, certainly uh, in the tens of seconds uh, until the connection is established that's relatively long if let's say you want to infrequently exchange a bit of data, uh, for example, uh, from an automatic teller machine, uh, a cash dispenser, or from some other uh, network device, uh, some some terminal somewhere that occasionally needs some some data. Um, and the the idea of the CSPDN is basically that you create a digital network. Um, and uh, you only have analog circuits from hop to hop. So this is a diagram uh, that shows, uh, describes the IDN um, uh, in, in, a, in a least line configuration. So there's no uh, automatic switching uh, in the middle, but basically we have a, a DEE, that's the data terminal equipment. Uh, then we have a DHE, that's the data communications equipment here at the subscriber. And then we have here that the, the black line is the is the uh, subscriber line going to uh, wherever the, the switch is located here, the first one, and only over uh, that link, uh, which is basically just a few kilometers uh, until the next switch, um, over that link, uh, you could use baseband transmission, so you didn't have to do modulation, um, meaning that the cost of this um, uh, transmission, uh, DCE, or here is the DAG, a Datenanschlussgerät, um, is the German word in this context, is much lower because you don't need modulation and demodulation, but you just need to do some coding and then you transmit the signal in uh, coding to avoid uh, a DC components. So you use some kind of coding scheme that avoids any uh, DC parts in your transmitted signal and you have an AC waveform in baseband that you communicate over the subscriber line. And at the other end, you have the peer, the UE, uh, the Übertragungseinrichtung, I think, is the is the name for it, Übertragungseinheit, um, which uh, has the same uh, basically in reverse, and it recovers the digital signal, and then you go into the next top of your communication uh, using the recovered digital signal. You again drive some kind of coding here in a in a time domain multiplex uh, ZD uh, Zeit uh, domain and multiplex and uh, you go some other hops. But the point is that at each intermediate step. You fully recover the digital signal so you don't have to cover hundreds of kilometers uh, over various different technologies in analog but you really have um, digital regeneration of the signal uh, at every hop and that makes the the end user equipment much uh, less expensive and much less complex and uh, that's i think the, the fundamental idea behind these cspdns um, that uh, uh, as, a, as a distinguishing feature and an advantage uh, technically over doing telephony network-based data transmission. So if we look at the network architecture of uh, the network um, in a very simple um, example here, then we have uh, the DTE, the terminal equipment, um, so some kind of really, a, a, let's say, a, a a paper-based terminal with a printer or a glass terminal or some kind of uh, mini computer or whatever that existed at the time. It connects over a serial interface. We will look at the different serial interface uh, of, of variants used, connects to the data communications equipment. Um, uh, it attaches to the subscriber line and it connects to something called a DUST, a Datenumsetzerstelle, that's a multiplexer. Um, that multiplexes multiple low bitrate signals. Low bitrate means 50 to 9,600 BPS into 64K uh, multiplexed uh, um, uh, time division multiplexed signals. And those 64 kilobit links then connect to the actual uh, DVST, Datenvermittlungsstelle, um, uh, which is the actual uh, switch. Um, and then the switches are interconnected over uh, PCM30 uh, multiplexers. Um, so that is uh, pulse code modulation uh, at, at two megabits with uh, 64 kilobit slots in between. And then at the uh, target uh, destination or the destination uh, switch, 
uh, it again gets broken out to some kind of uh, multiplexer over the 64k slot, which then breaks it out again to the 50 to 9600 BPS signal that uh, originally entered the network here. Um, that goes again to the data communication equipment on the customer side over the serial interface into the terminal at the other end. Um, so there could be, for example, some kind of mainframe computer at this end and a, a terminal, uh, um, like a, a serial terminal at the other end. Uh, so you could have remote um, attached serial terminals to, to mainframes uh, over this uh, network. Um, I mentioned before that the, like in a telephony network with uh, electromechanical switching, the call setup takes quite a long time. Um, here in this system and um, Datex L uh, with this technology was deployed in 1975. So in 1975 already they had call setup times below uh, 500 milliseconds. So if you would establish a channel from here to here to any other subscriber in Germany, assuming that the subscriber is not busy, of course, so the line is free at the other end, um, in less than half a second you have uh, the connection fully set up. Um, and you can exchange data with the user bit rate of uh, 50 to 9,600 BPS in a transparent way uh, with the peer. So for the time, I think it's uh, quite an achievement, um, not just the, the, the setup, but to, to build this in general, we will see this a bit more when we look at the hardware uh, that they used. Uh, it's it's um, quite a comprehensive technology for, for, for that time. So um, how did it look like geographically? Um, keep in mind, uh, this is a map of Germany and of course, Eastern Germany and Western Germany were still separated uh, in, in these days. Um, so again, to put this into the context of time, uh, the uh, idea to create this uh, network uh, started around 1970, uh, sorry, 1965. Um, the actual deployment happened in 1975. And it was shut down in 1996 after basically all the services had migrated over to ISTN. So it was rather short lived, um, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, a bit ahead of its time in, in many ways. Um, but then um, as ISTN and uh, came around and ISTN came at a time where a large scale integration and development of integrated circuits was already uh, very, um, uh, very common. Uh, it was, um, yeah very old suddenly uh, this technology so we had uh, 18 uh, dvsd datenvermittlungsstellen uh, data switches all across western germany and uh, west berlin of course um, and then each of those had a co-located dust d uh, that's a uh, datenumsetzerstelle uh, by der datenvermittlungsstelle i think is the is the expanded acronym is on the next slide and about 400, uh, the full capacity of the network was specified at 400 remote uh, multiplexes, which are dust U. Those are basically um, at other locations um, that were not close to those 18 uh, Datenvermittlungsstelle. Um, you put one of those remote multiplexes, those uh, dust U, Datenumsetzerstelle der unteren Netzebene. Uh, the German word for that uh, uh, to aggregate uh, subscriber lines close to the subscriber. So this is the terminology here. Yeah, so we have a Datenvermittlungsstelle, DVST, the, the data switch. We have the uh, DUST, Datenumsetzerstelle, uh, the multiplexers, and there are two, the one at am Standort der Datenvermittlungsstelle, which is co-located with the uh, switch. And then we had the remote ones uh, called the untere Netzebene of, well, the lower order network or something like that, if you want to translate it. Um, and uh, then uh, the, uh, the the terminal that the user uses is in German, it's called DEE, which is the Daten Endeinrichtung, the English acronym that uh, you know if you've looked at serial uh, protocols and specs like RS232 before. It's called DTE, Data Terminal Equipment. Then we have the DUE, Datenübertragungseinrichtung, that's the data communications equipment. Most people who've worked with analog modems, uh, that's basically your modem. But in this context, it is in most cases not an actual modem because there's nothing modulated, but it's baseband transmission. Um, the peer uh, at, the, uh, at the DUST is called an UEB, an Übertragungseinheit, which is the line transmission interface that talks to the DEE at the DUST side. 
Um, and then uh, the Siemens um, uh, product name for this was Datenfernschaltgerät DFG. So that's the Siemens implementation of a DUE, the Datenübersagungseinrichtung, which is the, the device at the customer premises that uh, interfaced the terminal with the network. So, um, which brings us to the interface between the DE and DE or the DTE and DCE interface. Um, I already said it's a serial um, uh, interface, uh, but of course it's not RS-232 uh, because it's actually, I think, older than that. Um, and um, the, that was the actual interface to the network. So on the telephony network, you think of the interface as the subscriber line, uh, the copper wires, um, but uh, in uh, this network, the interface is the serial port that comes out of the uh, data um, communications equipment. DATXL was a synchronous network, meaning that um, uh, the synchronous interfaces are the native interfaces and they were preferred. Um, there was X.20 at 300 bits per second and X21 at uh, 2.4, 4.8 and 9.6 kilobits. And uh, the asynchronous interfaces uh, X20 bis and X21 bis, uh, which um, uh, were used to connect equipment that like data terminal equipment designed for asynchronous communications to the synchronous network. And uh, the asynchronous interfaces were more expensive because uh, there was additional circuitry needed in the data communications equipment. Uh, I found some references that there was actually additional circuit board that was installed into the uh, data communications equipment. Um, uh, to do the uh, async to sync conversion. And then also in the end, you get lower net uh, data throughput as you have those additional start and stop bits and maybe even parity, which uh, need bandwidth. So you reduce your net uh, throughput. And given that uh, the, um, uh, the charges are uh, per time, so you pay per second uh, that you're connected. Uh, if you reduce your throughput, of course, everything gets more expensive. So what kind of services did we have in this network? Um, these are the services uh, that I could find documented. Um, allegedly, at the towards the end, there was also a 48 kilobit service. Um, I couldn't, uh, it's my, my literature is too old to, to already uh, list this as a production service. But uh, yeah, so in, in terms of the introduction, sorry, that's again a typo. This is 1980, um, the, not 1970. I uh, should have gone through the slides one more time. So in 1967, the original Datex service, I think it was just called Datex actually, and then later they said it's a Datex L200 when they introduced more services, was asynchronous and 50 to 200 bits per second, and they were still using analog electromechanical switching. And then when they introduced all these additional new services, uh, 300 bits to 9,600 bits, this was already on the... Uh, on the IDN, the integrated network uh, with its electronic switching and um, so on. And this was first introduced in 1976. And then every couple of years, as I said, 1980 here, the last one, uh, I guess, sorry for that, uh, higher bit rates were offered as a service. So um, uh, that's the, to put this in time. And as I mentioned already, it was provided until 1996. And in 1996, uh, it was uh, decommissioned and uh, switched off. These are uh, pictures of the uh, custom, customer premises equipment, the Datenübertragungseinheit. Here it's on the left-hand side, it's a DFG 300 for 300 bits per second communication. And on the right hand side, we have a DFG 2400 uh, for 2400 bits per second. You can see it's the same design, but some additional layers stacked in the middle in the, in the case, apparently, uh, for additional circuitry for the higher speed uh, um, uh, processing. So you actually have a, a dial pad uh, on the device, um, which you can use to dial. The, this was in, in the early days, this was the way how you uh, dial the uh, the destination subscriber, uh, when the X21 interface was introduced uh, with synchronous communication, then also uh, the X21 interface has facilities for uh, the dial information and the signaling to happen at the terminal. So the terminal could basically tell the, the um, DFG which destination subscriber to dial. 
I didn't mention the numbering plan here. I don't have a separate slide for this. Uh, so um, since it was a completely different network, of course, it also had a completely different numbering plan, meaning that uh, the numbers in the Datex L network are completely different number ranges and, and prefixes and subscriber numbers than the telephony network. And there's no interfacing between those two. Similarly, also the uh, the the da sorry the telex net uh, for the teletypes already also had its own completely separate numbering plan. So historically, each of those networks has its own numbering plans and and subscriber numbers. So this is the slightly later generation for 9,600 9, bits per second. Um, and here we can see then the split. There was a DFG uh, 9,600 UE1 which still allows you to manually dial here on the dial pad, the subscriber that you want to dial. And here the 9600 UE2 already looks more like a modem as we know it, some, some desktop uh, uh, brick uh, sized device, uh, which uh, doesn't have any buttons for dialing numbers since the actual number to be dialed was uh, conveyed over the X21 interface from the terminal into this device, which then signaled it towards the uh, electronic switch, the, the Datenvermittlungsstelle. So yeah, um, we already mentioned that the interface to the subscriber was the serial interface, the X20, X21 interface. Um, but nevertheless, of course, at least for me, it's interesting what did actually happen on the wire, um, uh, uh, even though it was not the public interface. I already said, depending on the distance, different technologies uh, were used. Uh, predominantly, it was baseband transmission using a pseudo ternary uh, encoding. Occasionally, when the next uh, Datenumsetzerstelle, the next DUST uh, multiplexer was too far away, so maybe some dozens of kilometers away, uh, I think up to 10 or 20 kilometers, they could do baseband. But uh, if it went beyond that, um, they actually had to use modems. Um, and uh, so they used a, a two-stage uh, differential phase shift keying or four-stage differential phase shift keying in a device called the UEM, the Übertragungseinheit Modem, and UEB is Übertragungseinheit Basisband. Um, in addition, uh, they added a so-called envelope um, on the wire to the um, data exchange. Uh, the envelope uh, means two additional bits. So every eight bit of user data were prefixed by two additional bits, the so-called envelope bits. One bit is used for synchronization purpose uh, since we are a synchronous network. A synchronization is somewhat relevant. And the other bit uh, is used to differentiate the user payload from signaling traffic. Um, so uh, since there's no additional signaling uh, channel, you could just uh, flip this one bit in the 10-bit envelope. And that meant that the 8-bit payload uh, suddenly became not user payload, but became signaling information to be terminated at the data switch, the Datenvermittlungsstelle. Um, this means that the line rate is 25% higher. So let's say you have a 9,600 bit per second service um, and the 9,600 bit per second uh, user, not user equipment, uh, Übertragungseinrichtung or the, the, that, the DFG. So basically the device we saw about one or two slides earlier. Yeah, this one, the 9,600 bit per second uh, versions. Then this means the line rate is actually 12,000 bits per second due to this additional two-bit envelope that gets inserted into the data stream on the line, on, on the subscriber line. Um, yeah, so how much did this cost? Um, we have all the different services here with the different interfaces and the monthly base fee. This is in Deutsche Mark. Um, uh, you have to apply a factor of um, 1.23 if you want to convert it to euro and compensate for the um, for the inflation since 1981 when this uh, I took this from the price sheet. So uh, if you look at this, it's it's in in today's euros and the equivalent uh, um, purchasing uh, um, power uh, and inflation and so on. Basically, it means uh, 123 euros uh, worth you would have to pay for the 300 bit per second uh, using the synchronous X20 interface. If you needed asynchronous interfaces, you had to pay 20 uh, marks more. Um, at the higher line rates, even 30 marks more. Uh, that's As I said, the asynchronous to synchronous adaptation was uh, something you had to pay extra for. So the synchronous interfaces were lower cost. 
So you can see a rather substantial monthly fee. Um, but then actually the, the, the fees per uh, connection or based on the duration are, I think, rather reasonable if you consider what you could do with them at the time. Uh, this is just a sheet from the original uh, documentation, how to compute this. I'm not going to go into this uh, in, in detail. It's just funny that uh, basically it's specified in fractional Pfennig, where Pfennig is one hundredth of Deutsche Mark, so a kind of a cent type. Uh, so, and it's specified per interval of 0 0.1 seconds. So you have fractional units of the monetary unit and fractional seconds, and then you have to multiply, and then you also have to add an additional uh, fixed uh, fee of five pfennig for each uh, successful connection establishment. So in the normal telephony network, we didn't have that. It was just time-based. So there was no separate fee for establishing the connection in the first place, but here they introduced this. And then there are different multipliers based on the speed. If you translate all of this and you use the inflation corrected conversion into Euro and you then uh, compute how much one megabyte of data transmission cost in each of those network technologies, then uh, and then this is uh, in the far distance um, uh, tariff. So more than 50 kilometers of distance between the two subscribers. Um, you you get to these rates, and if you look at well, of course, the 300 bit per second is not useful for transmitting megabytes of data. That was not what it was intended for. But let's say you get the 9,600 bit per second service, and you use it during the night. You could actually transmit one megabyte of data for uh, one euro 36 um, uh, all across Germany uh, in 1980. Uh, I think that's actually uh, rather reasonable. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, how much data one megabyte was in the day and uh, how much, let's say, uh, shipping, a, uh, buying a floppy disk and shipping it uh, in, in per mail or something like that would have cost you. So I think it actually is uh, rather reasonable during the day. Of course, it's much more expensive, um, but uh, still, I think uh, based on, on the time frame in which we put this, I think it's, it's uh, not super expensive. Of course, the monthly rate, um, you always have to consider that. And of course, there was a one-time setup fee, which was also not cheap. So yeah, as I said, this was like Datex L as the technology was deployed in 1967 with up to 200 bits per second. And then in uh, 1970 and 73, they already established uh, interconnections to France and Belgium uh, between the German network. Um, and then from 1976 onwards, it was this uh, higher bit rate uh, IDN network in Germany, and that then got interconnected to the NPDN, the Nordic Public Data Network, uh, which operated in Denmark, Finland, Norway, Norway, and Sweden. I haven't really found much else in terms of international interconnection. Um, I think the, the circuit switched uh, public uh, data networks were a relatively brief um, event in history. Since slightly later, um, uh, so I mean, this is mostly deployed in the late 60s and, and 70s, and from 1980, 81 onwards, the packet switched uh, public data networks uh, were around, and those I think saw much more users than the circuit switched uh, public data networks. So um, it was, uh, yeah, over relatively soon uh, with this technology. Now, if we look at a um, an actual like real world deployment of such a uh, switch. Um, now, if we think of a switch today, um, we think of some ethernet switch in a rack. If we think, think of a telephony switch, then we say, oh yes, some, some rack full of switching equipment. But uh, one of these data uh, switching stations, DVSTs, um, of which there were 18, as we saw in the, in the map, um, was actually a rather large, um, uh, floor plan. So that's a floor plan of how this was laid out. And the entire floor plan of what you see here is 1,200 square meters of floor. So uh, a lot of area required for uh, switching a little bit of data between left and right. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating what kind of monsters and what massive amount of technology they had to develop and deploy. So uh, these kind of uh, switches uh, the maximum capacity was uh, 16K uh, connections. Some of those connections were used internally and to interconnect the switches. So subscribers, you could connect uh, around 10 to 11,000 subscriber lines to such a, uh, um, a switch. 
the memory capacity, like the, the, the hardware maximum memory capacity was one megabyte, which is, I think, an absurd amount of memory for this was deployed in 1975. Yeah, that, uh, and according to the documents I have, all of them were deployed with the maximum memory capacity on day one. So they deployed uh, these switches with one megabyte of core memory. I'm talking about magnetic core memory, not uh, random access memory or, or something like that. So like individual uh, magnetic cores, uh, one megabyte for each of those uh, switches. Um, they were, the, the core setup rate uh, was about 30 per second. So um, uh, since the software doing all the, the, the switching and so on um, consumed a quite significant amount of time and you only had two, um, up to two uh, processes, each of them possibly redundant to uh, perform uh, the call setup handling. Uh, you could have a maximum of, if you have two of them, a maximum of 60 new call setups per second in the entire switch. Um, I guess that's probably why they charge the five cents uh, for each uh, call setup uh, to make sure they don't overload this uh, by people basically uh, making a call setup for every 50 bytes they're sending. Um, the power consumption is massive. So um, we're talking about 80 kilowatts at 60 volt DC. That's the normal um, DC voltage supply in German uh, telephone exchanges, plus another 15 kilowatts of uh, 220 volt back then AC power supply. Uh, that AC was for the peripherals, meaning the hard disks and, and uh, um, terminals and so on that were associated with the actual switch, which was powered by DC. Plus then the air conditioning to get those 100 kilowatts of uh, of electrical or then thermal energy out of the building again. Um, the net floor space of the racks and the equipment is 200 square meters. And as I said, with all the uh, additional stuff you need around it, about 1,200 square meters. Um, unbelievable scale for shifting a few bits from left to right um, from, from today's perspective. So, um, this was the chapter about the Datex L network. Now we're talking about EDS, the switch uh, behind it, um, the switching uh, technology behind it. I didn't study that in as much detail. I have tons of information. Um, it's a question of finding the time to really understand it uh, down to that level of detail. But I think it's, uh, yeah, so I'll just present an overview here. Um, so. At some point in the 60s, they, they, and they means the telephone administration, recognized the need for higher bit rate, higher than 50 BPS telex, a wide area data transmission. Um, and conceptual development was started in 1965 to develop this uh, um, digital switch for, for the um, public data network by Deutsche Bundespost. The development uh, was done in cooperation by Siemens and uh, Standard Electronic Lorenz, uh, two German um, equipment manufacturers. And the first production deployment was in Heidelberg in 1975. And by 1978, they had migrated all of 60% uh, of all their pre-existing Telex and Datex subscribers from the electromechanical switches over to this new uh, EDS-based uh, exchanges. And it was decommissioned in 96 um, uh, when ISDN was everywhere. And uh, you could basically emulate all of these services provided by so even if you had legacy equipment that was attaching to the Datex L network, you could just emulate all of this over ISDN. So there was no need for a separate uh, data network anymore. Um, note also ISDN, the integrated uh, services uh, data network. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it integrates telephony and the data network. So the IDN was overtaken by ISDN. This is the logical structure of the different functional units. I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, I mean, basically you have all these uh, connections that go into um, uh, code converters and decoders, um, and they are attached to uh, processing uh, elements. Uh, so this uh, PE is the program steuerung, is basically the, the program controller. You could say the CPU uh, doing that, and you have other elements and memory and, and so on. Um, this is the logical structure um, uh, of all the multiplexers in front of it. So you have the actual switch, which is several large racks of equipment, and then you have the multiplexers. Um, uh, I already mentioned in, in the telecom language or in the Bundespost language, it was the, 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 this part here, Vermittlung, is the 
the DVST, that's the actual switch. And then we have all these muxers here. They are uh, like uh, this triangular devices, like this C here or the SE here. Those are two different types of muxers. These are basically the DUST, the Datenumsetzerstelle. So you have something like uh, a Telex device or some uh, data device, uh, low speed, going to a, a subscriber line, going to uh, one of these C type muxers which then goes into an SE type max uh, up to 64 kilobit and that then goes into the uh, into the uh, switch over here. Um, this is how one of the uh, multiplexers looked like. This is uh, Datenumsetzerstelle uh, um, ZD100. I think it's a um, C type. So that's the, um, the, the low bit rate for 50 to 300 bit uh, channels and aggregating that into 64 kilobit channels. Um, so uh, as you can see a uh, rack mount unit here um, that, that goes into a rack um, and it aggregates um, uh, these lines up. Um, I couldn't find any um, pictures of the other type of multiplexer. I suspect it was looking rather similar. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of the hard disks, the peripherals that came with it. So we're talking about like this kind of washing machine sized equipment with the disk platter stack here, a removable disk platters. Uh, this was how software was installed on those devices. So um, basically you had, uh, there, there's also diagrams about the, the development process and the assembler and the linker, which was actually called binder in, in, in German, so the binder. Uh, was used to bind uh, the individual libraries and stuff together and um, from from um, punch cards and uh, the, then the, the machine prog executable program was stored on the platter stack here. The platter stack was inserted into uh, this uh, drive and from there the program was then loaded into the RAM of the, um, uh, of, of the actual switch. The hard disk storage, these units had a separate room. If we go back a couple of slides, there's actually a separate room here, the Plattenspeicherraum, which is a separate room in the floor plan of this entire exchange because it had even stricter um, uh, environmental uh, requirements. Um, so you can see here there was sort of a, um, how do you say that, a... a um, uh, now I'm lacking the English word. Uh, so you see it in many science fiction, like an airlock kind of a device, like in a, in a space station in science fiction, because uh, of the hard disks here, um, you the, the dust uh, particles had to be avoided uh, and there was very strict requirements of not having too many dust particles. And also the temperature and humidity range was much more constrained than for all of the other equipment. So there was a separate room with separate filters and air conditioning and so on just for these hard disk uh, drives um, uh, they put uh, there, which was uh, seen on this picture. Yeah. Yeah. And that brings me, uh, Reindon. Yeah, clean room indeed. Yes, it's a clean room. Of some extent, I don't think it's as clean as uh, modern clean rooms. When we think of semiconductor manufacturing, uh, we're talking about much larger particles, I think, in, in this context here. But yes, uh, indeed, a clean room uh, for the hard disk. So yeah, I didn't go into more details here. Um, there's a couple of books I scanned on, on this technology with more of these black and white pictures. But I mean, it's just racks and racks and racks full of equipment and cables. Um, I didn't want to put all of them in my slide deck, but uh, I can open uh, some of these PDFs and, and show you some of the pictures if you're interested in, in the equipment. Yeah, um, I didn't have a slide about what were people actually using this network for. Um, maybe that before we go for Q&A. Um, the initial low speed uh, up to 300 bit per second uh, um, systems were really meant for remote terminals. So you had something like a, a paper or a glass terminal uh, for remote interaction with a, a mainframe or some mini computer or something. Um, the higher bit rate uh, systems uh, with 2400 uh, bit per second were used, uh, for example, by the Teletex network, which is another topic that I'd like to speak about at some point. Um, uh, it's uh, some some ancestor of the telefax. So before we had the uh, facsimile, the telefax transmission, 
there was a predecessor um, uh, between Telex and, and the fax, and that was using Datex L as a, as a transmission medium at 2,400 bits per second. Um, and the higher bit rate, like 9,600 PPS, uh, was mainly used for batch uh, transmission. So uh, some mainframes exchanging batches of data overnight. Um, there also were some examples of, for example, um, banks um, using this technology with intelligent terminals. So you had, uh, let's say, somebody wanted to apply for a loan for, for buying a house or something like that. And then if the branch of the bank would have some intelligent term terminal with uh, some masks, uh, local masks on the screen, where you enter all the data of, of the applicant uh, for this loan, uh, including, uh, you know, the, 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 the usual stuff like uh, how much money per month uh, the loan will be repaid with and the duration of the loan and the total amount of money and so on and so on. And then uh, uh, when all the data was entered into those masks locally in the intelligent terminal, you would basically transmit that data to the mainframe um, to compute uh, the rates and, and uh, the, the rep loan payment plan and, and so on to create an offer for the customer. Uh, and so uh, quickly in less than half a second, the circuit switch data connection was established uh, then some data was exchanged uh, and the connection was terminated again. And the uh, the local masks and the software and the intelligent terminals was updated overnight uh, when the rates were low in the Datex network. So you could uh, do basically software updates overnight of, of these intelligent terminals. So these are the kind of applications that uh, this network was used. I didn't really find um, numbers of how many subscribers they had at any given point in time. I mean, they always say, well, we had more than 100,000 subscribers in total, but that includes the Telex subscribers, uh, all the, the legacy um, uh, teletype um, stuff. Um, so I haven't found them broken down to how many of these were actually using anything more than the 50 bit per second that they already had in their previous old uh, analog uh, electromechanically switched networks. Um, yeah, and with that, I'm going to uh, stop. And uh, yeah, if anyone has questions or comments uh, while the recording is still running, uh, please uh, raise them now. So the question is, could you connect calls between async and sync nodes? No. I mean, technically, yes, but I don't think it would have worked. Um, also, something that I didn't explicitly mention, but sort of it was implicit, is that um, your connection had one fixed speed. So uh, since there was different uh, monthly rates and different equipment, so if you had a line for, let's say, 9,600 PPS, that was the only supported speed of your line, and you could not interconnect to other subscribers using other speeds. So basically, if you had 9,600 bit uh, per second service, you could only connect to other 9,600 bit per second subscribers and, and, uh, and so on. Um, for the async and sync, um, I don't think so, no. Based on the technology, I think uh, like the call would have been established and you would be built for it, but no meaningful communication would have been possible between the sync and the async uh, terminal on, on both sides, as far as I understand the technology.